Greetings and welcome to this week's episode of Bronx Bombers. My name is Joe Rubenstein and it is Wednesday, March 7th, and the Yankees are in full gear and off to a fantastic start in spring training. And look, I have no idea why all these games aren't televised, really. I mean, it's 2018. And it's not like there isn't a demand for it, right? I mean, with the Knicks and the Rangers imploding, you know, why not show them all? But the ones that haven't been on TV, I've been able to hear on the radio. And man, it's like, what's it like? It's like that moment in The Wizard of Oz. Remember that moment when the film suddenly goes from black and white to color? That's how it feels when baseball comes back every spring. And what's exciting is we're getting some real production from some of the newer faces on the team. You know, Billy McKinney. Tyler Austin. Uh, But how about this kid, Miguel Andujar? This kid is putting on an absolute power show with the bat, and it'll be really interesting to see if he can beat out uh, Brandon Drury for that starting third base gig. And the pitching, other than Tanaka, has been great. And keep in mind, Tanaka gave up one earned run all of spring training last year, and then he was horrible once the season started. So don't draw too many conclusions just yet. But Sabathia was great, Montgomery, lights out, um, Sonny Gray as well. And with our bullpen and our power, if our starting pitching shows up this year, tough to beat. You can follow us on Twitter, at Bombers Podcast is the handle. You can like us on Facebook as well. You can subscribe to our show on iTunes or Stitcher. And you can send your comments and questions to joe at bronxbomberspodcast.com. And a new wrinkle and a new avenue for you to reach out to us. You can leave us voicemail now at our Google Voice uh, number, 646 854 Four nine five nine. Really, however you'd like to engage with us, we love engaging with you, and we really appreciate all your feedback. Coming up later on here in this episode, our Twitter poll this week, we asked about your favorite moment from the 2017 season, and I'll answer a fascinating question from one of our followers on the Yankees' appearance policy. Also, a deep dive into pitching as we take a hard look at the top four staffs in the American League, and our in-studio guest will be Danny Torres a local sports writer who's covered both the Yankees and the Mets, mostly the Mets, and he's a Mets fan. So we'll get Danny's thoughts on our friends in Queens. All that and more coming up on today's Bronx Bombers. Back after this. Bronx Bombers trivia. Who is the last batter faced by Don Larson in his perfect game in the 1956 World Series against the Dodgers? Was it A, Jackie Robinson, B, Dale Mitchell, C, Duke Snyder, or D, Gil Hodges? The answer coming up a little bit later in the podcast. And now here's Joe with this week's Main Thing. The term factoid was coined in the 1970s by the writer Norman Mailer, and his original definition was, quote, facts which have no existence before appearing in a magazine or newspaper, creations which are not so much lies as products to manipulate emotion, unquote. And of course, social media is overflowing with factoids. And when it comes to the legions of Yankee haters, factoids run rampant. For example, uh, last year we saw one quite a bit where, you know, Aaron Judge had to be on steroids. There was no way that he could actually be hitting 52 home runs as a rookie, you know, without the aid of drugs. Of course, no evidence was ever put forth. And this factoid was entirely false. But lately, a factoid used to downplay our potential this season. And this isn't entirely false, uh, but it's partly false. And that makes it harder to dismiss is that there are huge questions about our starting pitching, huge questions, much more so than with our nearest competitors, Houston, Cleveland, and Boston, about whom no such questions exist, apparently, and therefore those three clubs have a distinct advantage over us in the American League in 2018. And I got into a friendly debate on Twitter with a very intelligent Cubs fan named Anthony, and Anthony's talking points were similar to what we heard a year ago at this time from detractors, when I think maybe they had more validity. Um, If you remember a year ago at this time, no one picked us to finish higher than third in our division. No one. And this was the main reason why our starters were going to drag us down and Boston was going to run away with it on the strength of their starting pitching. So some of Anthony's specific remarks about our staff were, quote, Tanaka had an awful 2017 and needs to bounce back. Sonny Gray can never stay healthy. Sabathia is in the descent of a great career 
And then you have Jordan Montgomery, unquote. Now, that last statement there isn't technically a factoid. It is a fact that we do indeed have Jordan Montgomery, who, by the way, looked fantastic in that 8-3 to win against the Phillies last week. But to say, and then you have Jordan Montgomery, uh, has unspoken factoidal implications, namely that Montgomery is such a non-entity that arguments against him need not even be made. Uh, they're obvious. When, in fact, Montgomery, a rookie last year and our fifth starter, Um, had a better season than two members of Houston's 2018 staff, Lance McCullers and Garrett Cole. Now, the problem with Anthony's points is that like many, maybe even most factoids, they possess grains of truth, just enough to satisfy those who wish to be satisfied. But the truth is they're too broad and they're totally unsupported by data. So although presented as facts, they don't begin to approach fact status. For example, Tanaka didn't have an awful 2017. That is a factoid. Tanaka had an incredibly inconsistent regular season and a phenomenal postseason. Now, make no mistake, the first half of his season was awful. Um, By the All-Star break, he had a 5.47 ERA and was serving up dingers like it was going out of style. I remember Derek Jeter Day in May against the Astros. That was a low point. I think he gave up three home runs in the first and got booed off the mound. But his ERA in the second half was 3.77. Not great, but far better. And he finished the season with a career-high 9.8 strikeouts per nine innings. Uh, And as I said, in the playoffs, he was spectacular. 0.90 ERA overall. When we were down two zip against um, Cleveland, he pitched an absolute gem in the Bronx. That one nothing shutout really got us off the mat after the um, Girardi non-challenge fiasco. He also shut out Houston in Game 5 of the ALCS. And his one postseason loss... Uh, game one in Houston, he only gave up two runs. It was just, you know, our bats went to sleep down there. And Sonny Gray, who Anthony says can never stay healthy, another factoid. Gray pitched 162.1 innings last season, not a massive workload by any stretch, but more innings than Dallas Keuchel, Charlie Morton, and Lance McCullers of the Astros, and more innings than David Price and Eduardo Rodriguez of the Red Sox, about whom Yankee haters seem to have no questions at all. And Gray... Despite getting horrendous run support uh, as a Yankee, pitched to a 2.66 ERA in his first eight games in the Bronx. Now, he was a bit inconsistent after that, but he was good in the ALCS, and he had enough success last year that, you know, if he can build on it, that's a major weapon for us. And he was, in fact, healthy all season long and is in great shape as we speak. Now, Sabathia being in the descent of a great career, that is technically true. Uh, in that Sabathia is not the pitcher he was 10 years ago and has had knee problems. But last year, despite the shaky start, um, was his best season since 2012. Um, CC finished with a 3.69 ERA. And so to imply, as Anthony's statement does, that Sabathia's trend line has been a steadily descending line these past few years is false. The truth is, Sabathia has become an entirely different kind of pitcher, much more slider than fastball, an absolute master at generating soft contact, and other than Game 7 in Houston, he was also extremely good in the playoffs, pitched well in Cleveland, and shut out the Astros in Game 3. And the underrated uh, Jordan Montgomery, who doesn't merit an argument, apparently, had, as I said, a significantly better season than Garrett Cole. Cole was acquired by the Astros in December, And according to large portions of Houston fans and the Yankee-hating media, he's the second coming of Sandy Koufax, which makes total sense if you know nothing about Sandy Koufax or Garrett Cole. But look, I'm not saying there aren't questions about our staff. There's always questions. But I am saying there are questions about the other three staffs as well, as many if not more so. And the fact remains, and people forget this, our pitching was far more consistent in the postseason than our hitting was. I mean, in the first five games of that ALCS, our pitching gave up 11 runs. Houston's gave up 21, okay? And look, they won it fair and square. This isn't sour grapes. They were the better team. Um, But our fundamental problem was not the pitching. It was that we never hit in Houston. In any case, my debate uh, with Anthony, which I enjoyed, inspired me to take a deeper look at the four best pitching staffs in the American League, Houston, Cleveland, Boston, and the Yankees. And all four staffs 
have both first-rate talent and major questions. And for the purposes of this exercise, I included not just the starters, but the bullpen as well. Just because the way the game is played today, you know, roughly a third of each game belongs to the bullpen. So to discount relievers would be removing a giant piece of the puzzle, um, which wouldn't make sense. So today, I'll cover the Astros and the Indians, and then next week, I'll do the Red Sox and the Yankees. All right, so let's dive right in. Now with Houston, I mean, obviously Verlander had a postseason for the ages. It was a performance that really can't be criticized. He pitched great against the Red Sox in the ALDS as a starter and in relief. And um, he was the MVP of that series against the Yankees. And despite being 34 years of age, actually he's 35 now, um, he ate up a ton of innings in those two series and against the Dodgers in the World Series. But if you look at the numbers over the course of the regular season last year, um, Dallas Keuchel, who was the more hittable of the two in the postseason, remember the Yankees knocked him around pretty good in Game 5 in the Bronx, but Keuchel was the better pitcher last season than Verlander in pretty much every category. Um, Better ERA and whip as well. That's walks and hits per innings pitched. And by the way, Severino um, had a better season than either of those guys. Just looking at the numbers between Severino and Verlander, for example, Severino 2.89 ERA to Verlander's 3.36, 1.040 whip, to Verlander's 1.175, 10.7 strikeouts per nine versus 9.6 for Verlander, 2.4 walks per nine versus 3.1 for Verlander, not taking anything away from Verlander's year, which was excellent, or Keuchel's, which was even better. Um, But Severino's performance last year was exceeded only by Corey Kluber and Chris Sale. And this was reflected in the Cy Young voting as well, where Severino finished third behind those two guys. And don't forget, Severino is a lot younger and a lot cheaper than any of these guys. But despite the fact that um, Keuchel had a better year, I think Verlander is Houston's number one guy in 2018, followed by Keuchel. And then most likely in the rotation, we've got um, Garrett Cole, Charlie Morton, and Lance McCullers. That's how I see it shaking out. Now, those last two guys, um, Morton and McCullers, uh, had underrated seasons. There's no doubt about it. Morton more so than McCullers, and they both came up big in the postseason, but McCullers spent significant time on the DL last year, and he's the youngest member of a pretty old staff. In fact, of these four teams I'm looking at here, the Astros have the oldest staff with an average age of 30 on the button, and their three best pitchers are also their three oldest pitchers, uh, Keiko, Verlander, and Morton, all on the wrong side of 30. That's not to say they're falling apart exactly, but people are always talking about um, Tanaka's UCL, um, which has never been a problem, um, about Sabathia's knees, but those Houston pitchers have all had significant injury issues over the past few years. Um, McCullers has had recurring back problems. Keuchel was placed on the DL um, twice last year with neck problems. And Morton, um, 34 years old, has had hamstring issues. So, you know, and all these guys pitched big innings all the way to November last year. So, We'll see if there's a World Series hangover. There tends to be. I mean, if you look at the Cubs last year, the Cubs being the most recent um, seven-game World Series winner about whom we have data for the year after, um, all the Cubs starters from that 2016 championship season, which, like the Astros last year, went to November, dropped off performance-wise in 2017, a few of them dramatically, okay? Um, Not a single member of that staff had even close to the same season the year after. John Lester, not even close. His ERA went from 2.44 to 4.33. John Lackey from 3.35 to 4.59. And Arietta also declined. Arietta is still a free agent, by the way. And I do think because of Cleveland's surprise early exit in the ALDS last season, and it was a surprise. Remember, nobody had us winning that series. I mean, nobody. They had just won like 20 plus games in a row. Um, But I think because they bowed out early, people tend to forget how good that Cleveland staff really was last year. And um, it'll be more or less the same crew in 2018, at least the starters. Um, Corey Kluber, reigning Cy Young winner and a total machine. Um, Carlos Carrasco, who had a phenomenal season um, that was overshadowed by Kluber's dominance. Um, Carrasco finished fourth in the Cy Young voting behind Severino. Trevor Bauer, who after a bad start 
won 17 games. And then Mike Clevenger, um, who had an impressive sophomore year despite some wildness. And Josh Tomlin, who just, I love him. He just pounds the strike zone. Um, Tomlin led the majors with the fewest walks last year and looked strong last week, actually, against Milwaukee. But look, that Cleveland starting five, when you look at their numbers from last season and compare it to the stats for Houston's 2018 staff, Verlander, Keuchel, Cole, McCullers, Morton, the Cleveland staff's cumulative whip was 36 percentage points lower. The Cleveland Five had substantially more innings pitched, which is an underrated category when analyzing pitchers, the ability to eat up innings and rest the bullpen. Um, Cleveland's Five pitched a total of 841.5 innings. Um, That's with Tomlin spending almost all of August on the DL. Um, The Houston Five pitched 818 innings, so 23 fewer. Um, Cleveland staff is younger overall. Um, Strikeouts per nine was better as well. So there's no doubt in my mind that Cleveland has the edge over Houston with their starting rotation. Um, And as for Garrett Cole, again, don't believe the hype. Um, Last season with Pittsburgh, I'll say this for him, he ate up innings, um, 203. But on the other hand, hitters ate him up. He had a career high in hits, runs, earned runs, and walks. And that 4.26 ERA... Uh, by the way, was also a career high, and that wasn't a fluke. It actually represents a consistent trend. Cole's ERA jumped from 2.60 in 2015 to 3.88 in 2016, and then to 4.26 last year, and he also gave up 31 home runs last year. So this remark by the Astros owner, what's his name? Yeah, Jim Crane, this nitwit, Jim Crane, comes out gloating after the Astros signed Gary Cole, Cole, whose last season, you know, was a portrait of mediocrity. And this guy Crane, he says, anytime we can beat the Yankees, that's good. Come on, man. I mean, yeah, Cashman gave Cole a look. And yeah, Cashman was totally unwilling to part with any of our top prospects um, for this guy. And look what those prospects are doing in spring training. Killing it. I mean, Cashman's no dummy. It's not an accident or oversight that he's held on to that job for over 20 years now, and the Astros gave up a lot, frankly. So to say they beat us by signing Gary Cole, that's a major factoid. But getting back to Cleveland versus Houston, the bullpens, that's a different story. And that sort of flips the script because the Astros got better, not by much, and the Indians got worse by more than a little. Um, They lost Brian Shaw, who always killed the Yankees. Um, They lost him to the Rockies, so good for us. Um, Not so much for Cleveland. And they also lost Joe Smith, um, who had a great year last year. Smith uh, to the Astros and lefty um, Boone Logan to the Brewers. Having said that, the Indians still have Andrew Miller, right? I mean, who's better than anyone in the Astros pen. And they still have closer Cody Allen. Uh, Same goes. And the Astros bullpen was the weakest of these four teams last season, with the possible exception of Boston. So this is more a case of evening out than the Indians losing a huge amount of ground. But there's no sugarcoating it. The Indians are definitely going to be weaker in those final three innings this year. Not not a bad bullpen by any stretch, but it's not going to be the force that it was in 16 and 17. Now, as for the Astros, they picked up the aforementioned Joe Smith and also signed Hector Rondo. Now, Smith, who started last season in Toronto and then was on the DL for a while, and then he was picked up by Cleveland, he pitched well against the Yankees in the ALDS. No hits and just one walk in two and a third innings. And so Smith signed a deal with Houston in December, uh, two years, 15 million, which is a nice pickup for the Astros. Um, Now, Rondon who was the closer for the Cubs the past few years, um, did not have his best year last year. 4.24 ERA. So we'll see how he does in Houston. He got absolutely hammered by the Mets last week. But the Astros have certainly taken steps to address the one-week area on their roster. I mean, if you remember the World Series, they had Charlie Morton and Lance McCullers pitching major relief innings um, since Ken Giles was so unreliable. But that said, Houston still doesn't really have a quality left-hander in the pen, and the Yankees' bullpen remains significantly better. Um, But long story short, these are two quality pitching staffs, obviously. I think the Indians have the better starting rotation one through five, Um, but not by much, and the Astros have the better bullpen at this point, barely. And then looking at the teams as a whole, offense and defense, the Indians have had a remarkably quiet offseason. They watched all seven of their free agents get snapped up by other teams, Um, relievers Smith and Shaw, as we mentioned, but also first baseman Carlos Santana to the Phillies, um, Jay Bruce to the Mets, 
and veteran outfielder Austin Jackson to the Giants. And again, losing Brian Shaw, that's big. In five seasons in Cleveland, he never made fewer than 70 appearances. So it may take two guys to replace him. Um, and the AL Central is not going to be a cakewalk anymore. Let's not forget the Twins, okay, who had a remarkable run last year before falling to the Yankees in that wild card game. Um, the Twins have vastly improved their roster this winter. They've had the best offseason that nobody's talking about, and Minnesota could very well challenge Cleveland for the division title. Um, they totally overhauled their bullpen. They signed Addison Reed, who pitched very well in Boston last year, um, Zach Duke from St. Louis, and Fernando Rodney from Arizona, and they picked up starter Jake Odorizzi from the Rays, and they also signed first baseman Logan Morrison from the Rays uh, last week. The Rays, by the way, have absolutely gutted their team since I did my AL East piece about a month ago. Um, those two Florida teams are going to be a nice salty snack for the competition this year. Um, and with the Astros, while I don't necessarily see the Angels challenging Houston for the AL West division crown, um, the Angels are almost as much improved as Minnesota. Um, GM Billy Epler has done a remarkable job reshaping that team with big moves. Um, they picked up Shohei Otani, who has struggled a bit in spring training so far, but um, you know has also showed flashes of brilliance. Um, but they also signed um, outfielder Justin Upton to a long-term deal. That was big. Um, not cheap. 106 million over five years, but that's a big uh, that's a big bat. He hit 35 homers and 109 RBIs last year. Um, they signed Zach Cozart, Ian Kinsler. So I'll do my official season preview in two weeks. Um, but spoiler alert: I'm predicting that Houston and Cleveland's win totals will decrease this year based on increased competition within their divisions. And by the way, that's in line with Vegas odds makers. Um, Vegas has Houston winning five fewer games this year, Cleveland seven, which if that bears out, should give the Yankees who play Tampa more than those two teams do and also get the Marlins this year for interleague play. Um, that should give the Yankees a real shot at home field throughout the playoffs. Back in a moment. We are joined this week on Bronx Bombers by Danny Torres, freelance journalist who's covered both the Yankees and the Mets. Danny's work has appeared on MLB.com, Latinosports.com, LaVitaBaseball.com, and he's also contributed stories to the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, Danny grew up in the Bronx, but he's a diehard Mets fan, and we'll find out how that happened, and a few other things as well. Danny, it's great to have you with us today. How are you? An absolute pleasure, Joe, and uh, really looking forward to the show. Now, we're roughly the same age, so growing up as a kid in the 70s in the Bronx, um, that's a decade when the Yankees were on the rise and the Mets sort of went in the other direction, um, at least after that magical 73 playoff run. But tell the listeners a little bit about your Mets fandom growing up and how that began and why. I think when you look and say, you know, considering that we're pretty much in the same age bracket, I can vividly recall the 73 team, which actually this year is the 45th anniversary. I mean, obviously you're talking Tom Seaver, you're talking John Matlack, you're talking Jerry Kuzman, um, Felix Mian, a dear friend of mine, Jerry Grody, et cetera, et cetera. And that would really be my earliest recollection of the New York Mets. And at that time, I'm seven years old. One of the reasons that as a family, we all grew up Met fans uh, was simply what had occurred uh, sometime around 51, 52, where the Yankees actually had signed a Puerto Rican player by the name of Vic Power. For Puerto Ricans, he is known as Victor Peyo. And uh, he spent at least about two years uh, with the New York Yankees. And at that time, let's be honest, uh, and even maybe even today, the Yankees were a conservative organization and really would uh, pick and choose who would be a part of uh, their particular way, the Yankee way. And Vic Power, Victor Peyo, didn't fit that mold um, from what we gather in our history of those especially that have followed uh, players of Puerto Rican ancestry and players of uh, African-American ancestry. But at that time, Vic uh, was a flamboyant player, played first base. And this is early 50s, granted, uh, dated white women, light-skinned women. And the Yankees saw this. Uh, one of the running jokes that Vic Power would always say was, we'd say, well, listen, if I date the white women, Billy Martin was dating the African-American, the black women. And obviously that was one of the things that was that made up Vic Power was his sense of humor and uh, his deadpan humor. 
And uh, within two years, uh, Vic Power was shipped off uh, to the Philadelphia Athletics, eventually be, uh, being a part that they moved them to Kansas City. And Vic played for a number of teams, the Cleveland Indians, the Minnesota Twins. And uh, he ended up uh, winning uh, seven gold gloves and appeared in six uh, All-Star games. So what does that tell you? And I'll tell you this, talking about the New York Mets, if you ask Keith Fernandez, who's in the booth right now, but who obviously was a hell of a player, if you ask Keith who was the greatest first baseman, he'll tell you Vic Power. Now with Vic Power, I mean, his career started in the mid-50s. Um, obviously the Mets didn't exist yet. So where did your family go as far as rooting interest at that point? I was born in 66, so really I was brought into the, uh, how should I say, the fandom, the Met fandom, pretty much at my birth. I mean, my dad loved baseball. When he first came, uh, arrived from Puerto Rico in 51, the uh, first team that he actually saw was the Brooklyn Dodgers. And um, so obviously got a chance to see uh, Jackie Robinson play. But once the Brooklyn Dodgers leave, the New York Giants leave, obviously there was no uh, team to root for. Uh, Dad would go over to uh, Yankee Stadium, but I think that uh, what occurred with uh, Vic Power was always one of those things that stuck in the back of uh, of, da- of Dad's mind from the standpoint of what team he was going to cheer for. And of course, the Mets uh, come about in 62. And as they say, for those that follow the Mets, the Reds is history. So growing up in the South Bronx, I mean, obviously that's Yankee fan territory for the most part, right? I mean, how did the rooting interest break down in your neighborhood? I, I probably would have to say, in all honesty, Joe, I would say, yeah, it's, listen, it's the South Bronx. I grew up on 168th Street in Webster Avenue, the public housing complex there. And um, that's what, a 15-minute walk from Yankee Stadium? I mean, listen, I probably maybe was one of the few, but I think the fan that was a Met fan usually was someone of Puerto Rican ancestry. But I would say it was predominantly a, a Yankee crowd. Okay, so let's get into the Mets, who first played the Yankees on June 8th at City Field. Uh, now, personally, I thought the Mets had a really good offseason, and not just their player acquisitions. I'm a big fan of Mickey Calloway as their new manager. Calloway served as pitching coach with the Indians the last five years. Uh, and the Mets are a team that's built around pitching. That's their calling card. So, Danny, the Mets go from having the oldest manager in the majors, um, 68-year-old Terry Collins, to one of the youngest, 42-year-old Mickey Calloway. Um, give us your reaction on this managerial change. There's two words that stick out for me with Mickey Calloway. Number one, communication. I think every player has already stated publicly on SNY, on various news uh, outlets, they talk about during the off season how someone's calling and they did not recognize the number. And when they pick up or they hear the voicemail, they're both like, oh, my God, it's, uh, it's our manager. It's, uh, it's uh, Mickey Calloway. So that's the first thing is the communication for Mickey already to set the tone, the tone to pretty much say, uh, yes, there has been a change. But you know what? I'm going to be in your corner. My door is going to be open. But then when he meets the team publicly... For the first time, what does he start to already tell, not even just the press, but start to already tell his 2018 team? It's about accountability and the accountability of what my expectations are as your manager, the expectations as you as an individual player, a professional player, but certainly the expectations of the team. If you're giving me your best effort, if you're doing everything that we're doing from the standpoint of preparing you guys in the offseason and looking forward to 2018 of what the expectations are from the pitching staff, from those that obviously are bouncing back from a, a dreadful 2017 season. You, you know that as well, Joe, from the standpoint of uh, what occurred with the Mets pitching staff. But then you start looking at someone like uh, UNS Cespedes. Obviously, guys, we all know you got to live up to that contract. And just playing, I believe it was just 81 games, he had to look deep down inside and say, what did I do wrong from the standpoint of preparing myself physically? Did he lift too much weights? It seems like apparently one of the things that they were wondering is, did he hydrate himself enough? Was he drinking enough liquids to pretty much the intake of water on a daily basis when he's on the field? And the other thing is this, was golf a problem? an activity that he enjoys. So you're starting to get a sense that Mickey Calloway and his staff are pretty much looking at every player individually and saying, what do we have to do with that player to make him better 
and certainly be able to stay on the field, more productive, what's going to be the innings that we're going to get out of our arms from Harvey, from Steve Matz, from Syndergaard, because the only one that was in the 200 plateau was Jacob DeGrom. You know, general manager Sandy Alderson has been up front about the shortcomings in the Mets farm system. And so the Mets have to go the free agent route this winter. And they did address some key areas. So let's go through some of the bigger signings and maybe just give me your thoughts on each. And let's start with a familiar face to Mets fans, right fielder Jay Bruce, three years, 39 million. Um, Last year with the Mets and the Indians, 36 home runs, 101 RBIs. Good season. Um, Not great defensively, but I think along with Todd Frazier and Adrian Gonzalez, maybe Jay Bruce brings some of that veteran leadership to the clubhouse uh, that the Mets lost last year after losing Granderson and Neil Walker. Your thoughts? I think like so many who followed this uh, offseason and the transactions moving forward, There are a lot of players that are still out there, including my dear friend, Neil Walker. But I will say this, the Mets, like most of the organizations that were looking at free agency, they got a bargain. Three years, 30 million plus. Jay Bruce had a shaky start at Citi Field. He was getting booed. But once the comfort level started and Jay started basically ripping it up, you started to get a sense of what Cincinnati fans were enjoying. Now, here it is also with Jay Bruce. The Mets ended up deciding to make the move, and uh, he's traded to uh, the Cleveland Indians. Kind of a continuation there in the limited uh, amount of games. But guess what? The Cleveland Indians go to the playoffs. And Jay Bruce, I believe, hit two home runs in the playoffs. So what is that telling you about Jay Bruce? Jay Bruce already has playoff experience. Jay Bruce also, besides playing the outfield, was asked to play first base. So there's flexibility there. There is a presence to Jay Bruce. And let's be honest, too. We all love those lefty batters. Now, the Mets also signed right-handed reliever Anthony Swarzak, uh, two years, $14 million. Pitched well last year for the White Sox and the Brewers. And so with Swarzak joining Juris Familia, A.J. Ramos, and Jerry Blevins, That gives the Mets four proven arms in the pen. And the bullpen was a major problem last year, 29th in the majors with a 4.82 ERA. Um, And so, Danny, talk about Swarzak and this Mets bullpen. Optimism causes for concern as we look towards opening day in three weeks when the Yankees take on the Blue Jays in Toronto and the Mets take on the Cardinals at Citi Field. So you look at now the bullpen. Who's going to close? And let's be honest, right now it looks like it's going to be uh, Jerry's familiar. But he's coming in with an injury plague uh, season, 2017. Obviously, apparently, looks like he's all healed up. I could just tell you this. I, in my experience with him, he's a straight shooter, always open to speak to the media, and I believe is going to give you, for the most part, the best bet of closing out the games. But I love with having A.J. Ramos. The one thing I like about a player is a sense of humor. And A.J. Ramos, they actually had him the other day, and I just got a kick out of that because when you see players do these type of things, that for me tells me that, I could just see in the bullpen, he could be one of those guys of keeping the guys loose when it could be a pressure cooker situation. So AJ took a paper, wrapped it up, and was pretty much uh, interviewing Michael Conforto along with the other uh, reporters there. But he was just asking ridiculous questions. Conforto went with the flow. But at the end of the day, Conforto pretty much is like, well, you know, why don't you do it? You know, and all the reporters start to laugh. But I like when you could see a sense of humor out of a baseball player. So to have someone comical like that in a bullpen, hey, listen, you you don't want him to uh, blow a save or blow in, uh, in where he's in a setup role. But I love to see that as a part of a player's makeup. Obviously, uh, Suarezak comes in with an ERA under 300. So that's a good thing. Hansel Robles, OK, a little shaky last year, if not more than a little shaky. But, um, you know, the pitching staff, I mean, we can go on and on, but I definitely will welcome any particular questions with regards to the starting starting pitching staff. We'll definitely get to that. But before we do, I want to talk about another familiar face the Mets re-signed this year. Um, one-year deal, veteran shortstop Jose Reyes. Not great last year with the bat. Actually, his first half was a total disaster. Um, but much better after the All-Star break. And he's versatile. We saw him at second, third, and short last year. Um, And again, that veteran leadership, you know, it's something that 
you, you really can't measure that in stats. And Reyes was a real mentor uh, to rookie shortstop Ahmed Rosario last year over the final two months of the season or so. Rosario's played well so far this spring. And so with Reyes, Cabrera, Wilmer Flores, Todd Frazier, and either Gonzalez or Smith at first, I think Gonzalez probably, the Mets have some real options there. So your thoughts, Danny, on this New York Mets infield? Well, there's another player that we didn't mention, and I certainly hope that we'll see him uh, in 2018. That's TJ Rivera from the Bronx. And, uh, I think what ended up happening with him playing uh, at third base, it was pretty much a strain on that uh, shoulder of his where he had to obviously undergo uh, Tommy John surgery. But uh, I think for the most part, the Mets have a pretty solid infield. The veteran presence of a Todd Frazier. Uh, I thought the pickup from the Yankees, I'm surprised the Yankees didn't uh, decide to go uh, with Todd Frazier again. But the Mets, uh, you know, he's a great player. He obviously works the media very well. I hear he's very personable. I hear he's uh, quite friendly. I look forward to having a few words with him. But yes, you mentioned Jose Reyes. He's back on a five million uh, one year deal. And uh, that for me should have been probably maybe one of the first signings because Ahmed Rosario only played, I believe, um, 43 games. And it's amazing to think at the expectations in the New York market that the Mets or even maybe the Mets fandom. But even again, this is where media could be a little tricky. The expectations already, they're saying after 43 games, is he the real deal? After 40 something games with Dominic Smith, is he the real deal? Well, whatever happened to, you know, you're talking about the jump from double A to triple A and immediately to the majors because it was almost like the, the fans were pretty much uh, screaming for these players to come up and save the 2017 season. But listen, we got to let these guys grow. We got to let these guys make their mistakes in the AAA. The minor leagues is about fundamentals. The minor leagues is about still continuing the process of learning how to be a major league player on that level. But I think Ahmed's going to come along nicely. I think in the during the offseason, I saw some video of Ahmed. He was working out with Jose Reyes. So I think at the end of the day, uh, Met fans are going to be pleasantly surprised. I'm so happy Dominic Smith's a really nice guy, California guy. I'm so happy for Dominic that uh, he, I believe, went out to Arizona to pretty much just get himself in better shape. And uh, let's not knock Dominic Smith out yet. But if you were to ask me right now, who's your opening day first baseman? I really believe you should give it to Adrian Gonzalez. Let Dominic uh, stay in the uh, AAA, kind of like just see what he can do down there. Give Adrian Gonzalez that opportunity. You're paying him the major league minimum and just see what he's going to give you at least up to June. That's Danny Torres, freelance baseball journalist and diehard Mets fan. And you can hear part two of that conversation on the next episode of Bronx Bombers. Back in a moment. And now the answer to today's Bronx Bombers trivia question. Who is the last batter faced by Don Larson in his perfect game in the 1956 World Series against the Dodgers? The answer? B. Dale Mitchell. And now here's Joe with this week's Twitter poll. Yes, this week's Twitter poll results here on Bronx Bombers. We asked you this. What was the best moment of the Yankees' 2017 season? And 42% of our followers on Twitter at Bombers Podcast said Game 5 in Cleveland. 30% said the comeback from down 9-1 to against the Orioles. That was in April. 16% of you said when Aaron Judge broke Mark McGuire's record for home runs by a rookie. And 12% said the wildcard win over the Twins. I'm with the majority here. My, my view is that a playoff game has to take precedence over a regular season game. Uh, but that comeback against the Orioles, that was truly amazing and only made possible uh, by a couple of guys that aren't on the team anymore. And another who's sort of resented by Yankee fans, Jacoby Ellsbury, um, who's now out with an oblique injury. Ellsbury hit the first grand slam of his career in the seventh inning of that game. And then uh, Starlin Castro, who's now a Marlin, hit an absolute laser into the left field seats and that tied the game. And then finally, Finally, uh, Matt Holliday had the walk-off home run, and you know Buck Showalter on the bench for the Orioles was just the whole game. His face was getting redder and redder until finally, at the end, there it was like the color of I don't know a ripe tomato. Poor Buck. And the wild card game was great too, but those one game series, honestly, I don't really enjoy those because everyone knows a lesser team can beat a better team in any single game. I mean, for example, one one day this year, more than one day, you know, the A's or the White Sox or the Tigers 
will beat the Astros. That's just the way baseball is. So many things can go wrong. But Game 5 in Cleveland, that was special. And not not only because it saved us from having to hammer Girardi all winter for that stupid non-challenge. That would have been awful to lose the series from that, you know, and sit on that all winter. But um, it was a real team effort. Although it's worth pointing out the Indians didn't exactly help through on calls in that game. They had three errors and costly errors too. But Didi with home runs in the first and third off Kluber. Um, Indians score a couple in the fifth. And then Chad Green comes on and does his thing. And then that beautiful top of the ninth, man, Hicks gets a single, advances to second on a throwing error by Austin Jackson, now a giant. Um, Frazier walks. And then an absolute masterpiece of an at-bat by Brett Gardner. And I, I know a lot of Yankee fans think that maybe we should have dealt him this offseason and gotten some young blood in there. I never felt that way, um, especially with Todd Frazier gone. I like having Gardy and Sabathia in that clubhouse for veteran leadership. But Gardy, that 12-pitch at-bat was just amazing against the excellent Cody Allen. Um, he fouls off pitch after pitch and finally singles in Hicks. And another error scores Frazier. I think that was on Jay Bruce um, on a throw to Lindor. And Lindor was awful in that series. I mean, he's a great player, but man, he, I think he was two for 18. I think Jose Ramirez was two for 20. But Chapman comes in for a two inning save in that game five. And there you have it a classic series comeback for the Bombers on enemy turf. Pretty sweet. <laughs> All right, from this week's mailbag, our question of the week here on Bronx Bombers comes from Dante in Floral Park. Uh, and by the way, the email is joe at bronxbomberspodcast.com, or you can look us up on Twitter, at Bombers Podcast is the handle, or leave us a message at uh, 646 854 Four nine five nine, and Dante asks, I'm curious what you think of the Yankees' rule about beards and long hair. What if we go after Bryce Harper next year and he wants to keep his beard? Should they change the rule? Um, great question, Dante. So yeah, this issue flares up every now and again, ever since Steinbrenner instituted the rule back in 1973. And the rule states that players must have their hair cut above the collar and as Dante indicated, beards are verboten. Uh, mustaches are fine, so it does seem kind of arbitrary as far as what's allowed and what isn't. Um, but there's a great story about this. Uh, Lou Pinello, this is right after he came to the Yankees. Um, he was traded here from the Royals. So this is spring training, 1974, and I'm quoting Lou here. I didn't know Mr. Steinbrenner at all. I had just been traded to the Yankees. I was just joking around. I said, our Lord Jesus Christ had long hair, and things seemed to work out pretty well for him. Steinbrenner was silent for a few moments, and then he said, come with me. We walked across the street to the Fort Lauderdale swimming pool, and Steinbrenner looked at the pool, and then after a few seconds, he looked up at me, and he said, Lou, if you can walk on water, you can wear your hair any way you want, which I thought was pretty hilarious. And so this policy has been in place for decades, and sort of like the no names on the uniforms, it's kind of a Yankee signature. Um, but Mattingly, Don Mattingly was famously benched by manager Stump Merrill for defying the long hair policy. This was back in 1991. The Yankees were absolutely atrocious that year, and Mattingly was hitting over 300. He was like the lone bright spot. Um, but they said his hair was too shaggy, so they, you know, they benched him and they fined him. And eventually he got a haircut. But I remember thinking, you know, we're a sub-500 team, and this is what they're worried about? Really? But like I said, it does flare up. And when David Price was a free agent a few years ago, um, this is when his stock was considerably higher. Um, Price was told he would need to shave his beard if he became a Yankee. And he said, quote, I wouldn't sign a long-term deal there. Those rules, that's old school baseball. I was born in 1985. That's not something I want to be a part of, unquote. Um, not a fan of David Price at all. As I've said before, I think he's a giant baby, but I kind of see his point. I mean, on the one hand, Dante, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a libertarian on these matters. I think people should be free uh, to do what they want with their hair, um, facial or otherwise. It's a free country. And that's not something that somebody else should be mandating for you. And these are grown men. Um, and when I was younger, I remember thinking they should change the rule. It seemed, you know, outmoded and kind of ridiculous. But maybe because I'm a little older now, I don't know. I just sort of, I like the rule. Um, because A, it sort of forces players to adopt a team first attitude, which by the way, um, that's what I think the point is of the no names on the uniforms as well. Um, and B, it signifies that the Yankees are different, you know, that we set ourselves apart 
from the other teams that we have our own unique standards, our own, our own unique traditions. But Dante, as far as Bryce Harper, honestly, I don't see him becoming a Yankee. Um, Harper's made some very negative remarks over the past few years about New York City. Um, I think he said at one point, whenever he plays the Mets, he can't wait to get out of town. And then when the ideas come up before of playing for the Yankees, he seemed kind of lukewarm. And frankly, I think the Yankees are more interested in Machado. But if Miguel Andujar keeps hitting like this, and he's as good as he looks at third base, then maybe they pass on Machado and get a pitcher instead. I mean, you know, Sabathia is on a one-year deal right now, and he's not getting any younger. I mean, yeah, it would be great to have a guy with left-handed power like Harper in our lineup with that, you know, short porch in right field. But I don't see us going for him next year. I think we have different priorities. And as far as the policy, I would, if it was up to me, I would keep it for the reasons I said. And, you know, if a player gets a chance to come play for the New York Yankees and passes because he'd rather grow a beard, we don't need him. And that'll do it for this week's episode of Bronx Bombers. Again, don't forget, please subscribe via iTunes or Stitcher. Rate and review this podcast. Follow us on Twitter at Bombers Podcast. Like us on Facebook as well. Share it with everybody you know. And most of all, have faith in the Yankees. We'll see you again next week. <laughs>